Uh, hello, I'm uh, John Corsini, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariner's Museum and Park in Newport News, Virginia. You know, war is revolution. It could hardly be considered otherwise. The stress and strain of total and protracted war works unavoidable changes to men and society, and those changes are often fought to preserve the way life was before the war. But those technologies and the employment of greater technologies will often change the way we think and live. And such was the Civil War. And the Civil War introduced many <clears throat> new technologies to achieve victory in total war. Although balloonists like John, well, he actually calls himself Jacques Lamontagne, you know, little French flourish or something. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, Jean, uh, Jacques Montaigne, Lamontagne and Thaddeus Lowe achieved considerable fame during the war, but they were not the first um, balloonists, believe it or not. In fact, the Chinese used paper um, balloons or lanterns as they called them. Um, and between 2029 to 2034 AD, uh, Chancellor Zhu Lang army was surrounded by Mongolian troops and he used these lanterns as a signal to send reinforcements. Well, uh, that's really not the type of balloons we're talking about, but what I mean is that uh, uh, the French were the first ones to really develop effective hot air balloon. Um, and actually they practiced that, the Montgolfi, Golfa family, I don't speak French, uh, actually tested balloon flights from 1782 to 1784. Now, they didn't forget about this. So during the French Revolution, the war, the first coalition, the French employed what is known as their aerostatic corps. And they used the balloon Le Impotent to observe the Austro-Dutch uh, Austro army uh, during the June 26, 1794 Battle of Fuse. Napoleon, however, thought the balloons were worthless and he disbanded this balloon corps in 1799. Now, when Venice tried to free themselves from control by the Austrian Empire, and in uh, they, the Austrians, this is 1749, the Austrians get balloons and they attach bombs to them and they launch them from a deck of a ship called the SMS uh, Vulcan. And uh, those balloons, well, only one of them hit its target because the wind shifts and those uh, bomb balloons flow back over the Austrian lines and come near to sinking the Vulcan. So these ballooning activities set the stage for what we see during the Civil War. And uh, I have to say, Benjamin Franklin Butler, uh, and we all know him as uh, an unscrupulous lawyer, a slickster politician, but he contrives to become a brigadier general. He proves himself to be a hero in stopping the Maryland from leaving the Union and flushed with his success, uh, Abraham Lincoln orders him to go down to Fort Monroe, Virginia, to take command. And Butler at first says, no, I'm not going to do that. And Lincoln says, why? And Butler says, I'm in charge of an entire state, and you're putting me in charge of a little fort. And Lincoln said, you misconstrue my meaning. Uh, the Fort Monroe is the headquarters of the Virginia Department, uh, or the Union Department of Virginia. Well, that sounds all nice and dandy, but it was just Fort Monroe. So two lawyers working it out is unusual. So anyway, the, at uh, Fort Monroe, we have a small Union enclave surrounded by the Confederates. Confederates are at Young's Mill. Uh, they're at Big Bethel. They're at Sewell's Point, Pig Point. So they actually control everything around 
Fort Monroe other than the, the water access to the fort. So Butler becomes really concerned about where the Confederates are or his lack of knowledge of where they are. And so you have to realize with the outbreak of the war, all these balloonists or aeronauts rush to Washington to try and be the guy that's picked to head the U.S. Balloon Corps. Well, what's going to happen is Jacques Lamontagne misses out. He's kind of an unscrupulous fellow and hangs on the coattails of others. Nevertheless, he will be hired by Butler to come to the peninsula. Now he arrives, now I gotta tell you, Lamontagne worked with another balloonist, John Wise, to try to cross the Atlantic. One of their problems is they started in Cincinnati, Ohio, and they flew over 1,200 miles until crashing in Hendersonville, New York. This was famous. Somehow, Montaigne uh, maintains control of the balloon, and he uses it for again to try and cross the Atlantic. He fails, so he will actually have this balloon, and Butler hires him. La Montaigne will arrive on Fort Monroe on, um, on July 25th, 1861. Due to high winds, he can't make a launching. And so as a result of it, he has to wait until the light. This is Jacques La Montaigne there. Um, and he cannot loft his balloon until 31 July, 1861. And this panoramic view is kind of what Jacques Lamontain would see. He can notice the uh, Sewell's Point fortifications, the Craney Island fortifications, and, and so forth. So he's able to rely, relay to Butler some very valuable information. Now, he reached the height of 1,400 feet during that lofting. He does another ascension on August 1st, 1861. Uh, and he's able to see Confederate camps up the peninsula. So that's very valuable. He notes at Young's Mill, the Confederates must have between four and 5,000 men. That's probably double the amount that they had actually. But nevertheless, he's able to recognize Confederates are there. They're camped at Causey's Mill. <coughs> He also notes, um, well, instead of calling it Causey's Mill, he calls it Waters Creek, which was that the former name of what was once known Lake Mari, now um, is named in honor of the museum. So nevertheless, uh, what's going to happen is on August 3rd, 1861, La Montaigne makes or convinces Butler that he thinks he should be given a ship to loft his balloon from there. And so on uh, August 3rd, 1861, La Montaigne is going to lift his balloon from the deck of the USS Fanny using a windlass and mooring ropes. The balloon reaches the height of 2,000 feet and enabled a thorough inspection of Confederate positions defending Norfolk. A second flight was taken, well, I gotta tell you, uh, this flight on August 3rd is going to make the Fanny the first aircraft carrier in history. That's a great note. Um, so the second flight is going to be launched from the deck of the Tug Adriatic. Now, La Montaigne has used all his hydrogen gas. See, the big thing is we go from hot air balloons and then we need a gas um, that will able to float and control the balloon better. And La Montaigne does not bring enough materials to make more gas. So he is going to leave, but before he goes, he tells Butler, I will be back and I will be able to bomb and destroy Norfolk. And, you know, everyone pays attention. In fact, he closes his statement saying, ballooning can be a very useful implement in wartime. Well, out of the skies comes Professor Lowe. Now, when 
LaMontagne returns to Fort Monroe. Butler has been transferred away. Um, and so he's going to be replaced by 77-year-old hero of the War of 1812, Major General Brevet John Ellis Wool. And Wool uh, said, I don't need your services. So he tries to go back up to D.C. He, by that time, Thaddeus Lowe is already in charge. And he'll work for Thaddeus Lowe for a little while, and then he is dismissed. Lowe is a native of uh, um, a native of New Hampshire. Uh, he, even though he had a very limited education, he took to aeronautics very early and became an expert in applied sciences. And he built his first balloon, the Intrepid, uh, in 1858. He and his balloons went on tours. He was celebrated throughout the nation. And he actually invented a coal gas generate generator to produce hydrogen. I just want to, on a side note, he introduces how to make uh, ice um, without actually chopping ice, and he's actually a very successful inventor. Um, now, he had twice attempted a transatlantic voyage, but his fame increases when he made a nine-hour, 900-mile flight from Cincinnati, Ohio, to South Carolina between April 19th and 20th, 1861. Note that date. This is right after the capture of Fort Sumter. And when he lands in Unionville, South Carolina, the Confederates all proclaim him to be a spy. And as a result of that, uh, he will be arrested. Well, they'll soon release him and he rushes up to Washington where he'll be named Chief Aeronaut of the U.S. Army Balloon Corps. Now, um, his first real duty is going up in his balloon on 18 July, guess that date, uh, to observe where the Confederate positions are uh, below the Potomac. And uh, on that very same day, he is the first man to send a telegraphic message from a balloon to the ground. Uh, this is uh, shortly after the Battle of Manassas. He is going to do more observations to describe where the Confederates are. Um, and he actually, in September, becomes the first aerial ob obser observationist to actually provide direction for artillery. And that's a huge, big issue. He will become attached to George McClellan's Army of the uh, Potomac. And of course, McClellan wants to advance on his, uh, what we call, 1862 Peninsula Campaign. Now, I gotta tell you, Lowell has a balloon barge, which is called the uh, George Washington Park Custis. And he actually has several balloons and gas generators that are positioned on the barge. Some of those generators are able to be taken into the field. So anyway, um, George McClellan, just to give you a little background, will actually march, arrive on the peninsula. He'll start his march on April 4th. On April 5th, he runs into the Confederate what is known as the Warwick Yorktown line, commonly called the siege, the Civil War siege of Yorktown. And McClellan with 120,000 men stops uh, in front of these frowning Confederate fortifications. And the Confederate commander, Major General John Bankhead Magruder, will march his troops up and down his fortifications, uh, trying to give an appearance of having greater strength. Actually, Mary Boykin Chestnut said, it's a wonderful thing how he played his 10,000 before McClellan like fireflies and utterly deluded him. It's a 12 mile line. 
McClellan has all his siege books, right? And it all says that you do not defend a siege line without 10,000 men aligned. So McClellan immediately thinks that the Confederates have 100,000 men. He uses several ways to collect information about the uh, Confederates uh, using of the great kid who actually talked to contrabands or uh, escaped people who have escaped slavery. And he will, um, uh, but he keeps elevating these numbers just like McClellan wanted. As a result of that, Low on April 6, 1862, will launch his balloon, the Intrepid. Uh, and he begins uh, being able to notice, you know, what's out there. Now, usually these balloons went up in the air. Uh, excuse me, this is the fanny. Uh, there's Low. Here is a field generator getting ready to launch a balloon. Those are the field generators he uses. And of course, this is John Bankhead Magruder who stops uh, a McClellan in his tracks for almost a month. Now, these balloons are hydrogen balloons, very dangerous. I don't think they had a no smoking sign, but uh, nevertheless, these balloons were highly varnished and they had a net around them and they would be attached um, to the ground using three to four tether ropes. Usually two men would go aloft. One would be the operator and the other, the observer. And these balloons had this orange hue like the moon on some nights. So virtually every day, the Confederates saw this device rise up into the air. So they begin taking notes about what the Confederates have on uh, the morning of April 10th, Fitz John Porter who had already been taking several trips along the lines, but on that morning, he went up in the balloon alone. So he had wished to achieve higher uh, viewpoint. And so he actually will have just one tether rope. And so when John Allen, the James Allen, excuse me, the operator of the balloon tries to get in the balloon, the rope snaps like a shot, a pistol shot, and zoom, up in the air goes zoom, fits John Porter. Now, I have to tell you, the Intrepid's out of control, and Porter, who had, while he's been up there, observed how to operate the balloon, and um, he remained calm. He took notes about Confederate uh, positions, and then when it drifted over Confederate lines, it then drifted back over Union lines. McClellan is thoroughly upset by this circumstance. In fact, he wrote his wife, I am just recovering from a terrible scare. Early this morning, I was awakened by dispatch, stating that Fitz, Fitz John Porter, a good friend of McClellan, had made an ascension in the balloon that the balloon had broken away and had come to the ground some three miles southwest, which would have been within enemy lines. You can imagine how I felt. I was at once setting off various pickets to find out what they knew and to try and do something to save him. But no sooner had the order been given than in walks Mr. Fitz. Just as cool as casual, he had luckily come down near my camp after actually passing over my camp, you may rest assured one thing. You won't catch me in that confounded balloon, nor will I allow any other generals to go up in it. <clears throat> this was a huge scare for McClellan because Fitzjohn Porter was head of the siege operations. He actually will <clears throat> continue to go up in the balloon anyway with Brigadier General John Gross Bernard, the chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac, and they start to uh, make designs how, you know, where they can place their batteries, what is the ranging, how to focus the batteries on one Confederate position. So it becomes a very successful activity for them. Now, I have to tell you, 
Um, you know, the siege line uh, is actually about eight miles long because it kind of stops at what's known as Lee's Mill, which is now in Newport News. The Rasmus Darwin Kays, commander of the Fourth Corps, will actually be headquartered at um, uh, for, uh, at Warwick Courthouse. There's Fitz John Porter, and you can see here uh, the intrepid filling with gas. So um, this uh, is just another observation balloon going up. There's McClellan. This is Warwick Courthouse. And uh, I apologize, sometimes I forget to change the slides. Um, so at War Courthouse, um, they decide they're gonna set up another balloon camp. That camp is going to feature the balloon, the Constitution with its operator, James Allen. So this balloon was supposed to check the Confederate defenses between Lee's Mill and what is called Dam Number One on the Warwick River. See, Magruder had backed up uh, the river using dams, and uh, so it had created an effective defensive line. So, guess what? On June 10th, again, really a novel day for ballooning on the peninsula, 1862, um, he is going to be ordered. Well, he has, as he will write himself, the dubious honor of making several ascents in this balloon to observe the Confederate defenses. At first, Custer ridiculed the system of balloon reconnaissance when he was ordered to go up in the Constitution with James Allen. As a cavalryman, Custer thought, I had a choice as to the character of the mount but the proposed ride was far more elevated than I have ever desired or contemplated. By asked by Allen if he wished to go up in the balloon alone, Custer replied, if frankly expressed, I would not have been to go up at all. So Custer was nervous about the basket when he looked at its construction and uh, he will note, um, that when the balloon, he finally got into the balloon, and when the balloon finally rose up into the sky, um, basically, Custer hugs the bottom of the balloon. You know, uh, he is actually afraid. Uh, I was urged, as Custer's wrote, I was urged to stand up also. My confidence in balloons at that time was not sufficient, however, to justify such a course. So I remained in the bottom of the basket with a firm hold on either side. Once the Constitution had risen up to a proper height, uh, Custer um, was prompted to stand up. And he says he overcame his fears and stood up to make observations. To the, and, and he notes what he saw. To the right, it could be seen the York River, following which the eye could rest on the Chesapeake Bay. On the left, at about the same distance, flowed the James River. Between these two rivers extended the most beautiful landscape, no less interesting than beautiful. Custer recorded that the Confederate positions below, below him at the point over which the balloon was held was probably one mile from the nearest point of the enemy's line. In an open country, balloons would be invaluable to discovering the location of enemy camps and works. The enemy camps, like our own, were generally pitched in the woods. The earthworks along the Warwick River were also concealed by growing timber. Here and there, a dim outline of an earthwork could be seen uh, more than half concealed by the trees, which had been purportedly left standing in the front. Guns can be seen mounted and peering sullenly uh, through their embrasures, while men in considerable numbers were standing in and around the entrenchments, often collected in groups, intently observing the balloon, curious, no doubt, to know the character or value of the information its occupants could derive from their elevated point of observation. So although Custer took several um, flights, he really could not estimate the Confederates because Magruder had been very brilliant. The earthworks are right on the tree line, right? 
and you can't see where the Confederate camps are. You can only see parts of the Confederate works. So he cannot confirm or deny what Alan Pinkerton had been gathering um, his intelligence. So Alan Pinkerton's reports, you know, Alan Pinkerton works directly for McClellan. So of course, Alan Pinkerton's gonna say, yes, yes, yes. The Confederates have over 100,000 troops. In fact, the rumors are Beauregard has brought his entire army from the West to come uh, to defend the Yorktown. Well, so Magruder um, was just amazing during those first, first weeks of the siege. Now the Confederates, not to be outdone, decided to strike back in their own way. And number one, the noted artillerist Edward um, Porter Alexander elevated his cannons, which supposedly are the first anti-aircraft carriers used in military history, to fire at the balloons as they rose slowly up into the sky. They never hit one. So uh, nevertheless, um, the Confederates said, well, we're gonna get our own balloon. It was a roughly made device, um, some say made from the silks from the ladies' dresses in Richmond. Nevertheless, it was a hot air balloon, not a hydrogen balloon. And um, it was commanded by one of Magruder's aides, a man known as Lieutenant John Randolph Bryan of Gloucester County, Virginia. Actually, Brian had volunteered for a special assignment, and all of a sudden, you know, Joe, let me just tell you, Joe Johnson has just brought his army down to reinforce the peninsula, and he's at a place called Lee Hall, where Magruder has his headquarters, and he's camped outside next to this earthwork. You can actually go and visit, because there... Um, uh, actually, Johnson sees the balloon, sees Brian, and says, uh, what is this? Brian says, well, it's, you know, observation balloon. He says, well, let's see how it works. So the first lofting of a balloon will take place on April 16, 1862, at uh, Lee Hall Mansion, Magruder's headquarters. And uh, the thing, uh, you know, just rose up. In fact, Brian complains. I had never even seen a balloon, and I knew nothing about the management of it, but still he was ordered to go up in the flight. The balloon rises above the treetops. Brian remembers how federal shells and bullets whistle and sang and almost un unpleasant music about me. Yesterday, uh, according to artillerist David Ritchie of uh, uh, the uh, Mott's Battery, uh, will say, yesterday, the rebels sent up a balloon directly in front of us. But it was not in the air more than five minutes when suddenly it descended much faster than it rose, having received a sharpshooter's bullet. Well, you know, uh, Brian says nothing about that sharpshooter bullet. Um, he will continue to loft his balloon three other times, once more from Lee Hall, then from a site known as Winds Mill. Then he also lost his balloon from Yorktown itself. And um, uh, he made these uh, observations with somewhat uh, a trepidation, um, but nevertheless, his last voyage nearly resulted in a tremendous failure. Because as the balloon rose, there was a huge jerk and the uh, tether rope broke. And there goes Brian floating a uh, free fall across back to the Confederate line. The Confederates shoot at the balloon, the Union shoot at the balloon. Uh, and all of a sudden, it starts to float over the York River. Brian. Um, says, look, the balloon was jerked upward by great force for about two miles or so it seemed to be to me. I was breathless and gasping, trembling like a leaf from fear without knowing what had happened beyond the surmise that the rope which held me to the ground had broken. Now, 
He actually was blown over the camp of the second Florida. They thought it was the intrepid, shot at it. Uh, it then heads over the York River. And, um, and then the balloon started to settle rapidly. Bryant recorded, it was evident that I would soon be dumped in the middle of this broad expanse of water. He began to strip off his clothes, his boots, you know, he was virtually naked because he thought he was going to be swimming. Now, all of a sudden, a slight breeze picks the balloon up and takes it over to an orchard near Williamsburg, where the Confederate soldiers surround the balloon, threatening to shoot Brian. Brian goes, now, you know, I'm on your team, uh, but, you know, he just got his underwear on. So it's an odd sight. Needless to say, Brian never goes up in a balloon again. Now, um, so what happens to Civil War um, balloon observations after the Peninsula Campaign? You see Lowe follows McClellan all the way up. He launches his balloon during his bill, um, Beaver Dam, Savage Station, and so forth. However, he contracts malaria. So the Balloon Corps is not there at the Second Bull Run. It's not there at the Battle of Sharpsburg or Antietam. It's not there um, until Fredericksburg, but uh, it was awkward to haul into the field, especially in the road conditions. And so when Joseph Hooker takes command of the Army of the Potomac, he fires low, or actually low, will resign. And uh, as a result of that, uh, but puts an end to the United States Balloon Corps. Now, added to this, the Confederates haven't given up. They have taken their balloon and put it on board the gunboat, or actually armed tug, known as the CSS Teaser, now commanded by uh, Hunt, Lieutenant Hunter Davison, the hero on board the CSS Virginia during uh, the Battle of Hampton Roads. And he not only has the balloon, but he also has torpedoes, mines, that he was supposed to lay to have electrical contacts to the shore. He also has a map of where they'd already been laid. He has all the Confederate signal flag information. And so he rounds Turkey Point in the James River. And lo and behold, there is the USS Monitor and the... USS Martanza. Now, I have to tell you, the teaser has one rifle, 32 pounder, and it also has, um, there's Custer, Joe Johnson. This is the deck of the teaser. Uh, now, the first shot from the Martanza whizzed overhead. The second shot was that of canister with rattled the entire ship. Hunter Davison orders the abandonment of the ship and they swim to shore and the Martanza and Monitor capture the teaser, teaser. And thus ended the Confederate efforts to have a balloon core. Balloons made a effective, they were effectively used during uh, the Peninsula Campaign. Uh, they were effectively used at the beginning of the war. It was really pretty effective uh, to have these uh, aerial observations to see troop movements. During the siege of Yorktown, and it was hard to really estimate the troops there. But Jacques Lamontain had a pretty effective effort in actually observing the various, uh, various Confederate fortifications. Now, why did not, they not continue to use balloons? Number one, the Confederates had enough trouble just getting that one poorly designed device to get up into the air. So they did not put any more resources in it. The Federals thought it was too cumbersome to carry with the troops in the field, even though people like Fitz John Porter and George... Uh, Arnold Custer said, man, in the field, you can really see where the troops were. Just think, if Thaddeus Lowe had been in the air um, at the Battle of Chancellorsville and seen Jackson's flank march, <laughs> that would have changed history in so many different ways. 
it was not until World War I that we would really see the usage of effective um, observation balloons, actually, uh, the major school for the Army for the Army Balloon Corps during World War I will be at will be actually named the Lee Hall Balloon School in honor of where the Confederates launched their first balloon. By World War II, they were um, aerial observation balloons. They actually, the Germans employed Zeppelins, which is, you know, very large um, hydrogen airship. And they did that to uh, bombard um, Great Britain. Uh, by the 1920s, However, there are several serious wrecks of, um, you know, uh, airships, as they would call them, like the Roma, the Shenandoah, and then with the crash of the Hindenburg, the, the, the era of lighter than aircraft would end. And so the Civil War shows us how well aerial observations could work. Uh, it was a different time and different technologies, different road systems. So it really could not be used in a more mobile force and thus ended the glories of those men in the sky. So thank you very much for being uh, with me today, uh, talking about uh, balloons. I was very fortunate to find all these great quotes by people like Custer, McClellan, Fitz John Porter, et cetera, that told all about uh, what it was like to go up in the balloons. And so it's pretty fabulous. And nevertheless, um, if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them. We do have questions, John. Um, of course. We have with us today someone that, that portrays Thaddeus Lowe, uh, Kevin Knapp. I don't know if you know Kevin, but Kevin is definitely I met him before. A, a balloon expert and has shared, shared some great info with me here. But um, Kevin has shared some resources too, which um, about Thaddeus Lowe and, and others. So John, show your last slide, if you will, for people that if they want to ask you a question or whatnot while I'm getting into the-, the that, that is probably 15, 20 years ago and launch you there's an uh, intrepid in but head. one after yes yeah, yeah. so there's, there's yeah i got it right now let us hear from you yeah um so, but michael asked wasn't there a balloon used by union forces at island number 10 on the mississippi river not to my knowledge um um i have not seen that in the references to the Battle of N Island Number 10. Um, the Federals did not really need a balloon. This is, you know, they run past the batteries and um, at nighttime. So, and they had plenty of other opportunities for observation. So I have not seen that documented. I will go back and look through the official records to see if that it was indeed the case. Okay. Another Michael asked, is the Peninsula campaign or other campaigns during the war, did they use cameras to bring back photos to military on the ground? Well, it is said that um, Lowe actually used a camera, um, one of Brady's assistants, but uh, the age of cameras was not advanced enough at the time uh, to, be, to be as mobile. Once again, uh, they had to carry so much equipment and the balloons were really not that steady. So they didn't have the effective photography equipment like they would have during World War I and especially during World War II. They actually had aircraft uh, that were called snoopers mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, they actually had high, uh, very excellent different types of cameras in their nose. So, um, but uh, no, uh, it's just that that technology, see, you know, it's a war of technology, but that technology hadn't been approved, improved enough to make it as effective as it could be. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the problems with it. So. Well, we're, we're thankful that Matthew Brady got the pictures he did to show yes. us. Uh, because it would have been it's so extremely difficult. It's one thing to take them on the ground. 
It's another thing to take a photo in an unstable basket. Yeah. <laughs> and you just just the uh, qualities of the lenses were not uh, very effective. Now the telegraph the telegraph line and so if someone knew how to work the keys then you could send her down and i think that is the best type of fire control which the federals never really used me david asked how much involvement did lincoln have in promoting the balloon corps Well, he um, wanted the Bloom Corps to be created. And, um, and he advises Winfield Scott that that's what he wants. Irvin McDowell is actually the general that organizes the US Bloom Corps and selects who's going to be in charge. Now, I got to tell you, all these guys like John Wise and Jacques Lamontagne and Thaddeus Lowe are all in Washington. They're all lobbying to get the opportunity to become chief aeronaut. And it is Thaddeus Lowe uh, because of his pre-war fame and also because of his political connections that are going to allow him to be named into that position. So yes, Lincoln supported, you know, the amazing thing about Lincoln, he was into uh, technology and trying to find modern technology that would make a difference. I guess one of the great stories is with the Sharps rifle. Uh, Montgomery Meigs, Quartermaster General of the uh, US Army, when shown the, this wonderful repeating rifle, or carbine at the time, um, he said, oh, no, no, you, they won't aim, they'll just fire, it'll be a waste of ammunition. Just gets to go see Lincoln, Lincoln tries it out, says, daggum right, we're gonna use it. So Lincoln was an advocate of whatever new technologies that could be employed to give the Union victory. So, uh, Paul says he lives on Bryan Road near Yorktown and have always wondered who Brian was. Thank you for telling his story. So yeah, um, Brian was from Eagle Point Plantation um, on, uh, near Gloucester Point. And um, he actually later, after the war, went to Richmond and founded the Times Dispatch newspaper. Uh, so, oh, that uh, Brian. Okay. Uh, you know, that was that, that old, Brian, yes. That legacy, yes. His descendant uh, was later president of the Virginia Historical Society. And I, I knew him well. Okay. So, uh, rather well, actually. <laughs> Thanks so much for, for attending and for your participation. See you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye. Bye.